So this morning I was going to read this essay uh, that I hadn't read in a long time, and I thought, you know what, maybe I should read it out loud for the podcast because maybe other people want to hear it too. And so I did, but it took a lot longer than I thought it was going to take. So this is a bonus episode that kind of goes on a bit. Uh, and I'm telling you this for two reasons. One, if you just want to skip ahead to the, like the summary section, um, go to around minute uh, 54, maybe 55. Uh, there's a five-point summary that is from the essay itself. Two, I threw in a little Easter egg in this episode, which is a coupon for a free magnet which uh, I will send to you. I will even pay for the postage uh, if you get to that point in the episode of Free School for the Dogs Magnet, just for fun, uh, at least while we still have them. And uh, all right, here you go. Happy Monday morning, humans. I am going to take advantage of this quiet moment uh, in my home, quiet, because... My daughter's wonderful babysitter has brought her to the playground (laughs) to share with you uh, an essay I just looked up that I actually have not read in several years, but I remember leaving, it it left quite an impression on me when I did read it. It's from um, the, it's from Psychological Review uh, from 1913 by uh, John B. Watson. Um, I I looked this up because I am working on the some of the lectures that are going with our um, online professional course, uh, which I'm just finishing up these lectures. And um, I did uh, a lecture on like the history of dog training and the history of dog training and uh, both in the in universities and um, in pop culture, I guess is the best way to describe what the lecture is. And I mentioned uh, Skinner uh, and said something about how Skinner was influenced by the work of um, Ivan Pavlov and John B. Watson uh, both of whom were mostly working in the very early 1900s. And um, I, I kind of just started looking up stuff about John B. Watson. Uh, again, I got on kind of like a Watson kick a few years ago. Um, I, I read uh, part of his biography, which I'd actually like to look at again. I think Watson has probably do his own uh, episode at some point, but and is widely considered the the OG <laughs> the OG daddy of uh, the field of behavioral science as I understand it and um, he briefly put he he was a, a psychology professor I think at Johns Hopkins his most famous experiment was most likely the baby Albert experiment experiment where he showed you could condition a child to be scared of like all things fuzzy like rabbits uh, and that kind of thing um, by pairing similar fuzzy furry things with a loud scary noise. It's pretty cruel and weird considering he his uh, research subject was a non-verbal 18 month old boy named little Albert, but still interesting as it certainly relates to so much dog training where we see dogs become conditioned to fear seemingly random things. And um, he ended up leaving academics, I think because of some sort of affair he had with a student, and he ended up at the famous ad agency J. Walter Thompson, where he used what he had studied and learned about human behavior in order to manipulate humans into buying things. He is credited with having uh, popularized the idea of a coffee break, giving people uh, a built-in reason in their day to stop and go drink and buy 
coffee. So if you are a big coffee drinker as I am, you might just have uh, <laughs> have John B. Watson to thank for your very stained teeth. Interesting to note that Freud's cousin Bernays, who also knew a thing or two about um, the workings of behavior, is considered to be the founder of uh, modern public relations. John B. Watson, famous for saying, uh, give me a dozen healthy infants, well-formed, and my own specified world to bring them up in, and I'll guarantee to take anyone at random and train him to become any type of specialist I might select. Doctor, lawyer, artist, merchant, chief, and yes, even beggar man and thief, regardless of his talents, penchants, tendencies, abilities, vocations, and race of his ancestors. I am going beyond my facts, and I admit it, but so have the advocates of the contrary, and they have been doing it for many thousands of years. Uh, this is from his 1930 book, Behaviorism. Anyway, so he, he certainly was an extremist. I like that last sentence, or this that last quote, though, because to me, he's saying... I, the way I like to read it is he's saying I could use positive reinforcement to influence people and also manage, uh, thanks to a well-managed environment that I would get to control in order to get people to do these things rather than um, using punishment to discourage people who could do great things from doing great things. Maybe I'm reading into a little bit, because he also does talk about how you could teach someone to be a beggar man and thief, and he doesn't specifically say he would use positive reinforcement. He could certainly use negative reinforcement, but still, it's um, it's saying we can encourage people in certain directions uh, rather than discouraging their um, their talents and assuming they cannot be great. So... Um, I'm re going to read you guys this essay here. Uh, you can also just find a link to it in the show notes. But, um, yeah, I, I haven't read it in a while, and I thought, hey, if I'm going to reread it, might as well share it with you all. Uh, psychology, as the behaviorist views it, is a purely objective experimental branch of natural science. Its theoretical goal is the prediction and control of behavior. Introspection forms no essential part of its method, nor is the scientific value of its data dependent upon the readiness with which they lend themselves to interpretation in terms of consciousness. The behaviorist, in his effort to get a unitary scheme of animal response, recognizes no dividing line between man and brute. The behavior of man, with all of its refinement and complexity, forms only a part of the behaviorist's total scheme of investigation. It has been maintained by its followers generally that psychology is a study of the science of the phenomena of consciousness. It has taken as its problem, on the one hand, the analysis of complex mental states or processes into simple elementary constituents, and on the other, the construction of complex states when the elementary constituents are given. The world of physical objects, stimuli, including here anything which may excite activity in a receptor, which forms a total phenomena of the natural scientist, is looked upon merely as means to an end. That end is the production of mental states that may be inspected or observed, quote unquote. The psychological object of observation in the case of an emotion, for example, is the mental state itself. The problem in emotion is the determination of the number and kind of elementary constituents' presence, their loci, intensity, order of appearance, etc. It is agreed that introspection is the method par excellence by means of which mental states may be manipulated for purposes of psychology. On this assumption, behavior data, including under this term everything which goes under the name of comparative psychology, have no value per se. They possess significance only insofar as they may throw light upon conscious states. Such data must have at least an analogical or indirect reference to belong to the realm of psychology. So what I think that he's saying here is that traditional psychology has focused on 
the quality of the experience of feelings rather than looking at the outer reasons that cause said feelings to exist. In dog training terms, I would say this is the equivalent of trying to name and understand the quality of the way a dog feels, like saying that dog feels this way because he is being dominant and that is leading to X, Y, or Z behavior. Or he's saying like that is what modern psychology is doing rather than looking at um, the external factors that might be encouraging the dog to behave in certain ways um, and let's not try and guess what his feelings are in his head at least maybe this is the direction he's going in but I shall continue okay on to paragraph <laughs> uh, three we've made it to the third paragraph um, Indeed, at times, one finds psychologists who are skeptical of even this analogical reference. Such skepticism is often shown by the question which is put to the student of behavior, quote, what is the bearing of animal work upon human psychology, end quote. I used to have to study over this question. Indeed, it always embarrassed me somewhat. I was interested in my own work and felt that it was important, and yet, I could not trace any close connection between it and psychology as my questioner understood psychology. I hope that such a confession will clear the atmosphere to such an extent that we will no longer have to work under false pre pretenses. We must frankly admit that the facts so important to us, which we have been able to glean from extended work upon the senses of animals by the behavior method, have contributed only in a fragmentary way to the general theory of human sense organ processes, nor have they suggested new points of experimental attack. The enormous number of experiments which we have carried out upon learning have likewise con contributed little to human psychology. It seems reasonably clear that some kind of compromise must be effected. Either psychology must change its viewpoint so as to take in facts of behavior, whether or not they have bearings upon the problems of quote-unquote consciousness, or else behavior must stand alone as a wholly separate and independent science. Should human psychologists fail to look with favor upon our virtues and refuse to modify their position, the behaviorists will be driven to using human beings as subjects and to employ methods of investigation which are exactly comparable to those now employed in the animal work. So here I think what he's saying is, look, if we ignore the fact of similarities between the human animal and non-human animals and we ignore the research that we can do trying to understand psychology by looking at the behavior of non-human animals, then we're just going to have to do these same experiments on humans. Any other hypothesis? Uh, psychologist, as the behavior behaviorist views it, is a purely, sorry, is a purely experimental branch of natural science. Its theoretical goal is the prediction and control of behavior. Introspection forms no essential part of its methods, nor is the scientific value of its data dependent upon the readiness with which they lend themselves to interpretation in terms of consciousness. The behaviorist, in his effort to get a unitary scheme of animal response, recognizes no dividing line between man and brute. The behavior of man, with all of its refinements and complexity, forms only a part of the behaviorist's total sense, I'm sorry, total scheme of investigation. It has been maintained by its followers generally that psychology is a study of the science of the phenomena of consciousness. It has taken as its problem, on the one hand, the analysis of complex mental states or processes into simple elementary constituents, and on the other, the construction of complex states when the elementary constituents are given. The world of physical objects, stimuli, including here anything which may excite activity in a receptor, 
which forms the total phenomena of the natural scientist, is looked upon merely as means to an end. That end is the production of mental states that may be inspected or observed. Both of these are in quotes. The psychological object of observation in the case of an emotion, for example, is the mental state itself. Oh. Uh, is the mental state itself. The problem in emotion is the determination of the number and kind of elementary constituents present, their loci, intensity, order of appearance, etc. It is agreed that introspection is the method par excellence by means of which mental states may be manipulated for purposes of psychology. On this assumption, behavior data, including under this term everything which goes under the name comparative psychology, have no value per se. They possess significance only insofar as they may throw light upon conscious states. Such data must have at least an analogical or indirect reference to belong to the realm of psychology. Indeed, at times, one finds psychologists who are skeptical of even this analogical reference. Such skepticism is often shown by the question which is put to the student of behavior, quote, what is the bearing of animal work upon human psychology? I used to have to study over this question. Indeed, it always embarrassed me somewhat. I was interested in my own work and felt that it was important, and yet I could not trace any close connection between it and psychology as my questioner understood psychology. I hope that such a confession will clear the atmosphere to such an extent that we will no longer have to work under false pretenses. We must frankly admit that the facts so important to us, which we have been able to glean from extended work upon the senses of animal, animals by the behavior method, have contributed only in a fragmentary way to the general theory of human sense organ processes, nor have they suggested new points of experimental attack. The enormous number of experiments which we have carried out upon learning have likewise contributed little to human psychology. It seems reasonably clear that some kind of compromise must be effected. Either psychology must change its viewpoint uh, so as to take in facts of behavior whether or not they have bearings upon the problems of consciousness, or else behavior must stand alone as a wholly separate and independent science. Should human psychologists fail to look with favor upon our overtures and refuse to modify their position, the behaviorists will be driven to using human beings as subjects and to employ methods of investigation which are exactly comparable to those now employed in the animal work. And if you're just joining <laughs> uh, the whole, and as it relates to human psychology. No, oh, am I still here? All right. Um, any other hypothesis than that which admits the independent value of behavior material, regardless of any bearing such material may have upon consciousness, will inevitably force us to the absurd, absurd position of attempting to construct the conscious content of the animal whose behavior we have been studying. On this view, after having determined our animal's ability to learn, the simplicity or complexity of its methods of learning, the effect of past habit upon present response, the range of stimuli to which it ordinarily responds, the widened range to which it can respond under experimental conditions, in more general terms, its various problems and its various ways of solving them, we should still feel that the task is unfinished and that the results are worthless until we can interpret them by analogy in the light of consciousness. Although we have solved our problem, we feel uneasy and unrestful because of our definition of psychology. We feel forced to say something about the possible mental processes of our animals. We say that having no eyes, its stream of consciousness cannot contain brightness and color sensation as we know them. Having no taste buds, this stream can contain no sensations of sweet, sour, salt, and bitter. But on the other hand, since it does respond to thermal, tactual, and organic stimuli, its conscious content must be made up largely of these sensations and we usually uh, we usually add to protect ourselves against the reproach of being anthropomorphic if it has any consciousness surely this doctrine which calls for an analogical interpretation of all behavior data may be shown to be false the position that the standing of an observation upon behavior is determined by its fruitless its fruitlessness in yielding results which are interpretable only in the narrow realm of really human consciousness. 
The emphasis upon analogy in psychology has led the behaviorist somewhat afield. Not being willing to throw off the yoke of consciousness, he feels impelled to make a place in the scheme of behavior where the rise of consciousness can be determined. This point has been a shifting one. A few years ago, certain animals were supposed to possess associative memory, while certain others were supposed to lack it. One meets this search for the origin of consciousness under a good many disguises. Some of our texts state that consciousness arises at the moment when reflex and instinctive activities fail properly to conserve the organism. A perfectly adjusted organism would be lacking in consciousness. On the other hand, whenever we find the presence of diffuse activity which results in habit formation, we are justified in assuming consciousness. I must confess that these arguments had weight with me when I began to study behavior. I fear that a good many of us are still viewing behavior problems with somewhat something like this in mind. More than one student behavior has attempted to frame criteria of the psychic, to devise a set of ad objective, structural, and functional criteria which, when applied in the particular instance, will enable us to decide whether such and such responses are positively conscious, merely indicative of consciousness, or whether they are purely uh, physiological. Such problems as these can no longer satisfy behavior men. It would be better to give up the province altogether and admit frankly that the study of the behavior of animals has no justification than to admit that our search is of such a will-o'-the-wisp character. One can assume either the presence or the absence of consciousness anywhere in the phylogenetic scale without affecting the problems of behavior by one jot or one title, tittle. Uh, and without, <laughs> I like that he uses the word tittle, <laughs> and without influencing in any way the mode of experimental attack upon them. On the other hand, I cannot for one moment assume that the paramecium responds to light, that the rat learns a problem more quickly by working at the task five times a day than once a day, or that the human child exhibits plateau in his learning curves. These are questions which vitally concern behavior and which must be decided by direct observation under experimental conditions. This attempt to reason by analogy from human consciousness, uh, pro from human conscious processes, sorry, to the conscious processes in animals and vice versa, to make consciousness as the human being knows it, the center of reference of all behavior, forces us into a situation similar to that which existed in biology in Darwin's time. The whole Darwinian movement was judged by the bearing it had upon the origin and development of the human race. Expeditions were undertaken to collect material, which would establish the position that the rise of the human race was a perfectly natural phenomenon and not an act of special uh, creation. Variations were carefully sought along with the evidence for the heaping up effect and the weeding out effect of selection. For in these and the other Darwinian mechanisms were to be found factors sufficiently complex to account for the origin and race differentia differentiation of man. The wealth of material collected at this time was considered valuable largely insofar as it tended to develop the concept of evolution in man. It is strange that this situation should have remained the dominant one in biology for so many years. The moment zoology undertook the experimental study of evolution and descent, the situation immediately changed. Man ceased to be the center of reference. I doubt if any experimental biologist today, unless actually engaged in the problem of race differentiation in man, tries to interpret his findings in terms of human evolution, or ever refers to it in his thinking. He gathers his data from the study of many species of plants and animals, and tries to work out the laws of inheritance in the particular type upon which he is conducting experiments. Naturally, he follows the progress of the work upon race differen differentiation in man and in the descent of man. But he looks upon these as special topics, equal in importance with his own, yet ones in which his interests will never be vitally engaged. It is not fair to say that all of his work is directed toward human evolution or that it must be interpreted in terms of human evolution. He does not have to dismiss certain of his facts on the inheritance of coat color in mice because, forsooth, they have little bearing upon the differentiation of the uh, genus, 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 I think it's genus, homo, into separate races, 
or upon the descent of the genus Homo from some more primitive stock. Still with me here, some of you. <laughs> In psychology, we are still in that state of development where we feel that we must select our material. We have a general place of discard for processes, which we anathematize so far as their value for psychology is concerned by saying, this is a reflex. That is a purely physiological fact which has nothing to do with psychology. We are not interested as psychologists in getting all of the processes of adjustment which the uh, processes I'm sorry, processes of adjustment, which the animal as a whole employs and in finding how these various responses are associated and how they fall apart, thus working out a systematic scheme for the prediction and control of response in general. Unless our observed facts are indicative of consciousness, we have no use for them. And unless our apparatus and methods are designed and method are designed to throw such facts into relief, they are thought of in just as disparaging a way. I shall always remember the remark one distinguished psychologist made as he looked over the color apparatus designed for testing the responses of animals to monochromatic light in the attic at Johns Hopkins. It was this, and they call this psychology. I do not wish unduly to criticize psychology. It has failed signally, I believe, during the 50-odd years of its existence as an experimental discipline to make its place in the world as an undisputed natural science. Psychology, as it is generally thought of, has something esoteric, has something esoteric in its methods. If you fail to re reproduce my findings, it is not due to some fault in your apparatus or in the control of your stimulus, but it is due to the fact that your introspection is untrained. The attack is made upon the observer and not upon the experimental setting. In physics and in chemistry, the attack is made upon experimental conditions. The apparatus was not sensitive enough. Impure chemicals were used, etc. In these sciences, a better technique will give re reproducible results. Psychology is otherwise. If you can't observe three to nine states of clearness and attention, your introspection is poor. If, on the other hand, a feeling seems reasonably clear to you, your introspection is again faulty. You are seeing too much. Feelings are never clear. Okay, so this to me is like saying uh, that when um, we are training dogs, uh, so much depends on the observer being right or being wrong it's so um it's it's s subjective um one person might think one dog is dominant another might not think the dog is one person might think the dog is stubborn or aggressive the other person might think that the dog is perfect because maybe they want the dog to be a guard dog who knows but the point i think that he's making is that it doesn't seem like we're approaching this very scientifically if the best tool we have to describe these things is that of the observer and two observers may be different. That, that we need more precise instruments for um, dissecting behavior. Continuing. Uh, the time seems to have come when psychology must discard all reference to consciousness, when it need no longer delude itself into thinking that it is making mental states the object of observation. We have become so enmeshed in the speculative questions concerning the elements of mind, the nature of conscious content, for example, imageless thought, attitudes, and buistenlage, a word I've never heard of, um, that I, as an experimental student, feel that something is wrong with our premises and the types of problems which develop from them. There is no longer any guarantee that we all mean the same thing when we use the terms now currently in psychology. Take the case of sensation. A sensation is defined in terms of its attributes. One psychologist will state with readiness that the attributes of a visual sensation are quality, extension, duration, and intensity. Another will add clearness, still another that of order. I doubt if any one psychologist can draw up a set of statements describing what he means by sensation, which will be agreed to by three other psycho psychologists of different training. Turn for a moment to the question of the number the number of 
isolable sensations. Is there an extremely large number of color sensations or only four, red, green, yellow, and blue? Again, yellow, while psychologically simple, can be obtained by superimposing red and green spectral rays upon the same diffusing surface. If, on the other hand, we say that every just noticeable difference in the spectrum is a simple sensation, and that every just noticeable increase in the white value of a given color gives simple sensations, we are forced to admit that the number is so large and the conditions for obtain obtaining them so complex that the concept of sensation is unusable, either for those either for the purpose of analysis or that of synthesis. Titch, Titchener, who has fought the most vigilant, I'm sorry, the most valiant fight in this country for a psychology based upon introspection, feels that these differences of opinion as to the number of sensations and their attributes as to whether there are, uh, as to whether there are relations in the sense of elements and of on the many others which seem to be fundamental in every attempt to, I'm sorry, every attempt at analysis are perfectly natural in the present undeveloped state of psychology. While it is admitted that every growing science is full of unanswered questions, surely only those who are wedded to the system as we now have it, who have fought and suffered for it, can confidently believe that there will ever be any greater uniformity than there is now in the answers we have to such questions. I firmly believe that 200 years from now, unless the introspective method is discard discarded, psychology will still be divided on the question as to whether auditory sensations have the quality of extension, whether intensity is an attribute which can be applied to color, whether there is a difference in texture between image and sensation and upon many hundreds of others of like character. The condition in regard to other mental processes is just as chaotic. Can image type be experimentally tested and verified? Are recondite thought processes dependent mechanically upon imagery at all? Are psychologists agreed upon what feeling is? One states that feelings are attitudes. Another finds them to be groups of organic sensations possessing a certain solidarity. Still another and larger group finds them to be new elements cor correlative with and ranking equally with sensations. My psychological quarrel is not with the systematic and structural psychologist alone. The last 15 years have seen the growth of what is called functional psychology. This type of psychology decries the use of elements in the static sense of the structuralist. It throws emphasis upon the biological significance of conscious processes uh, instead of upon the analysis of conscious states into introspectively isolable instruments. I have done my best to understand the difference between functional psychology and structural psychology. Instead of clarity, confusion grows upon me. The terms sensation, perception, affection, emotion, volition are used as much by the functionalist as by the structuralist. The addition of the word process, mental act as a whole, and like terms are frequently met. After each serves in some way to remove the corpse of content and to leave function in its stead. Surely, if these concepts are elusive when looked at from a content standpoint, they are still more deceptive when viewed from the angle of function, and especially so when function is obtained by the introspection method. It is rather interesting that no functional psychologist has carefully distinguished between, quote, perception, and this is true of the other psycho psychological terms as well, as employed by the system systematist and see perceptual process as used in uh, functional psychology. It seems illogical and hardly fair to criti criticize the psychology which the systematist gives and then to utilize his terms without carefully showing the changes in meaning which are to be attached to them. I was greatly surprised some time ago when I opened Pillsbury's book and saw psychology defined as the science of behavior. A still more recent text states that psychology is the science of mental behavior. When I saw these promising statements, I thought, now surely we will have text based on different lines. After a few pages, the science of behavior is dropped and one finds the conventional treatment of sensation 
information, perception, imagery, etc., along with certain shifts in emphasis and additional facts which serve to give the author's personal imprint. One of the difficulties in the way of a consistent functional psychology is the parallelistic hypothesis. If the functionalist attempts to express his formulations in terms which make mental states really appear to function, to play some active role in the world of adjustment, he almost inevitably lapses into terms which are con connotative of interaction. When tax with this, he replies that it is more convenient to do so and that he does it to avoid the circumlocation and clumsiness which are inherent in any uh, thoroughgoing parallelism. As a matter of fact, I believe the functionalist actually thinks in terms of interaction and resorts to parallelism only when forced to give expression to his views. I feel that behaviorism is the only consistent and logical functionalism. In it, one avoids both Skyla. I think that's how you say that word, of parallelism, and the charabidus uh, of interaction. Those time-honored relics of philosophical speculation need, tr trouble, uh, need trouble the student of behavior as little as they trouble, trouble the student of psychics. I'm sorry, of uh, physics. <laughs> <laughs> like the student of physics. Uh, the consideration of the mind-body problem affects neither the type of problem selected nor the formulation of the solution of that problem. I can state my position here no better than by saying that I should like to bring my students up in the same ignorance of such hypotheses as one finds among the students of other branches of science. This leads me to the point where I should like to make the argument constructive. I believe we can write a psychology, define it as Pillsbury, and never go back upon our definition, never use the terms consciousness, mental states, mind, content, introspectively verifiable imagery, and the like. I believe that we can do it in a few years without running into the absurd terminology of Beer, Beth, Van Uxel, Noel, and that of the so-called objective schools generally, it can be done in terms of stimulus and response, in terms of habit formation, habit integrations, and the like. Furthermore, I believe that it is really worthwhile to make this attempt now. The psychology which I should attempt to build up would take as a starting point first the observable fact that organisms, man and animal alike, do adjust themselves to their environment by means of hereditary and habit equipment. These adjustments may be very adequate, or they may be so inadequate that the organism that the organism barely maintains its existence. Secondly, that certain stimuli lead the organisms to make the responses. In a system of psychology completely worked out, given the response, the stimuli can be predicted. Given the stimuli, the response could be predicted. Uh, such a set of statements is crass and raw in the extreme, as all such generalizations must be, yet they are hardly more raw and less re realizable than the ones which appear in the psychology texts of the day. I possibly might illustrate my point better by choosing an everyday problem which anyone is likely to meet in the course of his work. Some time ago I was called upon to make a study of certain species of birds. Until I went to Tortugas, I had never seen these birds alive. When I reached there, I found the animals doing certain things. Some of the acts seemed to work particularly, I'm sorry, peculiar, peculiarly well in such an environment, while others seemed to be unsuited for their type of life. I first studied the responses of the group as a whole and later those of individuals. In order to understand more thought, more thoroughly the relation between what was habit and what was hereditary in these responses, I took the young birds and reared them. In this way, I was able to study the order of appearance of hereditary adjustments and their complexity, and later the beginnings of habit formation. My efforts in determining the stimuli were, which called forth such adjustments were crude indeed. Consequently, my attempts to control behavior and to produce responses at will did not meet with much success. Their food and water, sex and other social relations, light and temperature conditions were all beyond control in a field study. I did find it possible to control their reactions in a measure by using the nest and egg or young as stimuli. 
It is not necessary in this paper to develop further how such a study should be carried out and how work of this time, kind must be supplemented by carefully controlled laboratory experiments. Had I been called upon to examine the natives of some of the Australian tribes, I should have gone about my task in the same way. I should have found the problem more difficult. The types of responses called forth by physical stimuli would have been more varied and the number of effective stimuli larger. I should have had to determine the social setting of their lives in a far more careful way. These savages would be more influenced by the responses of each other than was the case with the birds. Furthermore, habits would have been more complex, and the influences of past habits upon the present responses would have appeared more clearly. Finally, if I had been called upon to work out the psychology of the educated European, my problem would have required several lifetimes. But in the one I have at my disposal, I should have followed the same general line of attack. In the main, my desire in all such work is to gain an accurate knowledge of adjustments and stimuli calling them forth. My final reason for this is to learn general and particular methods by which I may control behavior. My goal is not the description and explanation of states of consciousness as such, nor that of obtaining such proficiency in mental gymnastics that I can immediately lay hold of a state of consciousness and say, this as a whole consists of gray sensation number 350 of such and such extent occurring in conjunction with the sensation of cold of a certain intensity, one of pressure of a certain intensity and extent, and so on ad infinitum. If psychology would follow the plan I suggest, the educator, the physician, the jurist, and the businessman could utilize our data in a practical way as soon as we are able experimentally to obtain them. Those who have occasion to apply uh, psychological principles practically would find no need to complain as they do at the present time. Ask any physician or jurist today whether scientific psychology plays a practical part in his daily routine, and you will hear him deny that the psychology of the laboratories finds a place in his scheme of work. I think the criticism ex is extremely just. One of the earliest conditions which made me dissatisfied with psychology was the feeling that there was no realm of application for the principles which were being worked out in content terms. Okay, this is me speaking now. I'm taking a break. This is taking a lot longer to read than I thought it would. If you're still with me here, <laughs> go to anniegrossman.com slash Watson and uh, put in your information. I'm going to send you a free magnet just for getting this far. Free school for the dogs magnet. <laughs> uh, for getting this far in the episode while supplies last. All right, let's continue here. What gives me hope that the behaviorist position is a def defensible one is the fact that those branches of psychology which have already partially withdrawn from the parent, experimental psychology, and which are consequently less dependent upon introspection, are today in a most flourishing condition. Experimental Experimental pedagogy, the psychology of drugs, the psychology of advertising, legal psychology, the psychology of tests, and psychopathology are all vigorous are all vigorous growths. These are sometimes wrongly called practical or applied psychology. Surely there was never a worse misnomer. In the future, there may grow up vocational bureaus which really apply psychology. As present, these fields are truly scientific uh, and are in search of broad generalizations which will lead to the control of human behavior. For example, we find out by experimentation whether a series of stanzas may be acquired more readily if the whole is learned at once or whether it is more advantageous to learn each stanza separately and then pass to the succeeding. We do not attempt to apply our findings. The application of this principle is purely voluntary on the par part of the teacher. In the psychology of drugs, we may show the effect upon behavior of certain doses of caffeine. We may reach the conclusion that caffeine has a good effect upon the speed and accuracy of work, but these are general principles. We leave it to the individual as a... Uh, we leave it to the individual as to whether the results of our test shall be applied or not. Again, in legal testimony, we test the effects of recency upon the re reliability of a witness's report. We test the accuracy of the report with respect to moving objects, stationary objects, color, etc. It depends upon the judicial mach machinery of the country to decide whether these facts are ever to be applied. 
for a pure uh, psychologist to say that he is not interested in the questions raised in these divisions of the science because they relate indirectly to the application of psychology shows in the first place that he fails to understand the scientific aim in such problems and secondly that he is not interested in a psychology which concerns itself with human life. The only fault I have to find with these disciplines is that much of their material is stated in terms of introspection, whereas a statement in terms of ob objective results would be far more valuable. There is no reason why appeal should ever be made to consciousness in any of them, or why introspective data should ever be sought during the experimentation or published in the results. In experimental pe pedagogy, especially when can see the desirability of keeping all of the results on a purely objective plane. If this is done, work there on the human being will be comparable directly with the work on animals. For example, at Hopkins, Mr. Ulrich has obtained certain results upon the distribution of effort and learning using rats as subjects. He is prepared to give comparative results upon the effect of having an animal work at the problem once per day, three times per day, and five times per day. Whether it is advisable to have the animal learn only one problem at a time or to learn three abreast. We need to have similar experiments made upon man, but we care as little about his conscious process during the conduct of the experiment as we care about such processes in the rats. I am more interested at the present moment in trying to show the necessity for maintaining uniformity in experience procedure and in the method of stating results in both human and animal work than in developing any ideas I may have upon the changes which are certain to come in the scope of human psychology. Uh, let us consider for a moment the subject of the range of stimuli to which animals respond. I shall speak first of the work upon vision in animals. We put our animal in a situation where he will respond or learn to respond to one of two monochromatic lights. We feed him at the one, positive, and punish him at the other, negative. In a short time, the animal learns to go to the light at which he is fed. Uh, interesting, he uses positive and negative here for punishment and reward differently than uh, Skinner. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. In a short time, the animal learns to go to the light at which he is fed. Um, at this point, questions arise, which I may phrase in two ways. I may choose the psychological way and say, does the animal see these two lights as I do, i.e. as two distinct colors, or does he see them as two grays differing in brightness, as does the totally colorblind? Uh, phrased by the behaviorist, it would read as follows. Is my animal responding upon the basis of the difference in intensity between two stimuli or upon the difference in wavelengths? He nowhere thinks of the animal's response in terms of his own experiences of colors and grays. He wishes to establish the fact whether wavelength is a factor in the animal's adjustment. If so, what wavelengths are effective and what differences in wavelength must be maintained in the different regions to afford basis for differential responses? If wavelength is not a factor in adjustment, he wishes to know what difference in intensity will serve as a basis for response and whether that same difference will suffice throughout the spectrum. Furthermore, he wishes to test whether the animal can respond to wavelengths which do not affect the human eye. He is as much interested in comparing the rat spectrum with that of the chick as in comparing it with man's. The point of view when the various sets of comparisons are made does not change in the slightest. However, we phrase the question to ourselves, we take our animal after the association has been formed, and then introduce certain control experiments which enable us to return answers to the questions just raised. But there is just as keen a desire on our part to test man under the same conditions and to state the results in both cases in common terms. The man and the animal should be placed as nearly as possible under the same experimental conditions. Instead of feeding or punishing the human subject, we should ask him to respond by setting a second apparatus until standard and control offered no basis for a differential purpose. Do I lay myself open to the charge here that I am using introspection? My, my reply is not at all, that while I might very well feed my human subject for a right choice and punish him for a wrong one, and thus and thus produce the response if the subject could give it, there is no need of going to extremes even on the platform I suggest, but be it understood that I am merely using the second method as an abridged behavior method. We can go just as far and reach just as dependable results by the longer method as by the abridged. In many cases, the direct and typically human method cannot be safely used. Suppose, for example, that I doubt the accuracy of the setting of the control instrument in the above experiment, as I am very likely to do if I 
suspect a defect in vision. It is hopeless for me to get the introspective report. He will say, there is no difference in sensation. Both are reds, identical in quality. But suppose I confront him with the standard and the control, and so arrange conditions that he is punished if he responds to the control, but not with the standard. I interchange the positions of the standard and the control at will and force him to attempt to differentiate the one from the other. If he can learn to make the adjustment even after a large number of trials, it is evident that the two stimuli do afford the basis for a differential response. Such a method may sound nonsensical, but I firmly believe we will have to resort increasingly to just such method uh, where we have reason to detrust the language method. There is hardly a problem in human vision, which is not also a problem in animal vision. I mentioned the limits of the spectrum, threshold values, absolute and relative, flicker, uh, tablet law, Weber's law, field of vision, the peringy phenomenon, etc. Everyone is capable of being worked out by behavior methods. Many of them are being worked out at the present time. I feel that all the work upon the senses can be consistently carried forward along the lines I have suggested here for vision. Our results will, in the end, give an excellent picture of what each organ stands for in the way of function. The anatomists and the physiologists may take our data and show, on the one hand, the structures which are responsible for these responses, and on the other, the physics-chemical relations which are necessarily involved, physiological chemistry of nerve and muscle in these and other reactions. The situation in regard to the study of memory is hardly different. Nearly all of the memory methods in actual use in the laboratory today yield the type of results I am arguing for. A certain series of nonsense syllables or other material is presented to the human subject. What should receive the emphasis are the rapid rapidity of the habit formation, the errors, peculiarities in the form of the curve, the persistence of the habit so formed, the relation of such habits to those formed when more complex material is used, etc. Now such results are taken down with the subject's introspection. The experiments are made for the purpose of discussing the me mental machinery involved in learning, in recall, recollection, and forgetting, and not for, those, not for the purpose of seeking the human being's way of shaping his responses to meet the problems in the terribly complex environment into which he is thrown, nor for that of showing the similarities and differences between man's methods and those of other animals. The situation is somewhat different when we come to a study of the more complex forms of behavior such as imagination, judgment, reasoning, and conception. At present, the only statements we have of them are in content terms. Our minds have been so warped by the 50-odd years which, which have been devoted to the study of states of consciousness, consciousness that we can envisage, envisage these problems only in one way. We should meet the situation squarely and say that we are not able to carry forward investigations along all of these lines by the behavior methods which are in use at the present time. In extenuation, I should like to call attention to the paragraph above where I made the point that the introspective method itself has reached a cul-de-sac with respect to them. The topics have become so threadbare from much handling that they may well be put away for a time. As our methods become better developed, it will be possible to undertake investigations of more and more complex forms of behavior. Problems which are now laid aside will again become imperative, but they can be viewed as they arise from a new angle and in more concrete settings. Will there be left over in psychology a world of pure psychics, to use Yerkes' term? Uh, I confess I do not know. Uh, the plans which I most favor for psychology lead practically to the ignoring of consciousness in the sense that that term is used by psychologists today. I have virtually denied that this realm of psychics is open to experimental investigation. I don't wish to go further into the problem at present because it leads inevitably over into metaphysics. If you will grant the behaviorist the right to use consciousness in the same way that other natural scientists employ it, that is, without making consciousness a special object of observation, you have granted all that my thesis requires. In concluding, I suppose I must confess to a deep bias on these questions. I have devoted nearly 12 years to experimentation on animals. It is natural that such a one should drift into a, into a theoretical position which is in harmony with his experimental work. Possibly I have put up a straw man and have been fighting that. 
There may be no absolute lack of harmony between the position outlined here and that of functional psychology. I am inclined to think, however, that the two positions cannot be easily harmonized. Certainly, the position I advocate is weak enough at present and can be attacked from many standpoints. Yet when all this is admitted, I still feel that the considerations which I have urged should have a wide influence upon the type of psychology which is to be developed in the future. What we need to do is to start work upon psychology, making behavior, not consciousness, the objective point of our attack. Certainly, there are enough problems in the control of behavior to keep us all working many lifetimes without ever allowing us time to think of consciousness, consciousness and sitch. Or actually, I think it would be pronounced zik. I just looked up the note on this. It says it is an allusion to the German ding and zitch. Uh, which means thing in itself, a phrase used by the German philosopher Immanuel Kant to refer to the things of the world apart from our knowledge of them. Kant argued that we can never know the world directly, never know the ding and zitch, uh, but only its presentation in consciousness. And then I asked the Google how you say that, and it is... Ding and zick. So there you go. <laughs> Once launched in the undertaking... We will find ourselves in a short time as far divorced from an introspective psychology as the psychology of the present time is divorced from faculty psychology. We, we did it. We did it, guys. We finished. <laughs> uh, at the end is a five-point summary. One, human psychology has failed to make good its claim as a natural science due to a mistaken notion that its fields... I, I can't talk. I'm reading an essay from 1913. <laughs> due to a mistake, sorry, that's my daughter calling me. They're back from the park now. Uh, due to a mistaken notion that its fields of facts are conscious phenomena, and that introspection is the only direct method of ascertaining these facts, it has enmeshed itself in a series of speculative questions, which, while fundamental to its present tenets, are not open to experimental treatment. In the pursuit of answers to these questions, it has become further and further divorced from contact with problems which vitally concern human interest. Two, psychology as the behaviorist views it is a purely objective experimental branch of natural science which needs introspection as little as do the sciences of chemistry and physics. It is granted that the behavior of animals can be investigated without appeal to consciousness. Heretofore, the viewpoint has been that such data have value only insofar as they can be interpreted by analogy in terms of consciousness. The position is taken here that the behavior of man and the behavior of animals must be considered on the same plane as being equally essential to a general understanding of behavior. It can dispense with consciousness in a psychological sense. The separate observation of states of consciousness is, on this assumption, no more a part of the task of the psychologist than of the physicist. We might call this the return to a non-reflective and naive use of consciousness. In this sense, consciousness may be said to be the instrument or tool with which all scientists work. Whether or not the tool is properly used at present by scientists is a problem for philosophy and not for psychology. 3. From the viewpoint here suggested, the facts on the behavior of amoeba have value in and for themselves without reference to the behavior of man. In biology, studies on race differentiation and inheritance in amoebae from a separate division of study which must be evaluated in terms of the laws found there. The conclusion so reached may not hold in any other form, regardless of the possible lack of generality. Such studies must be made if evolution as a whole, is ever to be regulated and controlled. Similarly, the laws of behavior in amoebae, the range of responses, and the determination of effective stimuli of habit formation, persistency of habits, interface and reinforcement of habits, uh, inter I'm sorry, interference and reinforcement of habits, must be determined and evaluated in and for themselves regardless of their generality or of their bearing upon such laws and other forms, if the phenomena of behavior are ever to be brought within the sphere of scientific control. Four, this suggested elimination of states of consciousness as proper objects of investigation in themselves will remove the barrier from psychology which exists between it and the other sciences. The finding of psychology become... Uh, the findings of psychology become the functional correlates of structure and lend themselves to explanation in physico-chemical terms. Five, and lastly, 
Uh, psychology as behavior will, after all, have to neglect but few of the really essential problems with which psychology as an introspective science now concerns itself. In all probability, even this residue of problems may be phrased in such a way that refined methods in behavior, which certainly must come, will lead to their solution. I would love to know what you think of this essay. If you uh, see anything here that relates to what you think or what you thought about dog training. I'll post a link to it in the show notes, but also in our new community app. You can get there by looking up School for the Dogs community in the App Store or go to schoolforthedogs.com slash community. I'm going to post it there as well. And um, yeah, really interested in anyone's thoughts. Thanks for listening to this whole long thing. I'm off now to go take a coffee break.